This is Clive Riddle, President of MCOL, and I'm here to welcome William DeMarco, President of Pendulum Healthcare and DeMarco & Associates, making a presentation for us for our Contracting Web Summit for Healthcare Web Summit. Welcome, Bill, and uh, we're pleased to have you here today. Well, thank you for the invitation. We always like working with you and your team, uh, reach a large audience, and uh, get a lot of good questions from these types of uh, presentations. So uh, I think this is the future. Good. Well, why don't you go ahead? I, I know you're going to talk to us today about some ACO developments as they relate with contracting. I'm really looking forward to uh, what you have to say. Sure. Well, I think we uh, are seeing uh, lots of activity uh, once the regulations were passed. Uh, on April 10th, uh, CMS announced that it entered into agreements uh, with 27 accountable care organizations uh, to participate in the Medicare Shared, Shared Savings Program. Uh, and according to CMS's announcement, these ACOs included about 10,000 physicians, 10 hospitals, 13 physician organizations, and they're going to treat about 375,000 beneficiaries in 18 states. Uh, 27 ACOs joined the 32 Pioneer model ACOs, and uh, they announced, uh, of course, participation last December, and these are the big, big uh, ACOs out there. Uh, but CMS has also announced five ACOs that will participate in the advanced payment ACO model, effective April 1. These are mostly rural uh, and smaller physician-based ACOs who are going to receive uh, shared savings payments on an earlier timetable than the other ACOs in order to offset their startup cost, and we're pleased to tell you that of those five that were accepted, we were involved with three of those. So uh, very, very excited to continue to work with some of these groups in some of the communities where they're looking for growth as well as efficiency. And uh, there's going to be another second round uh, for July 1st, uh, and they've received about 150 applications, according to my contacts and at CMS, and there's another 50 applications for the advanced payment model. So uh, we're off to the races uh, with this, and the interesting thing is uh, it's it's really signaled a couple things. Uh, first off, uh, a lot of payers uh, and providers uh, are suddenly consolidating. Uh, they're hoping to wield more power, I think, with each other. Uh, and what's happened is it's really threw the spotlight on uh, the primary care uh, as being an essential, uh, as not the essential component uh, of building a uh, solid uh, ACO. So as the uh, commodity known as primary care becomes more and more valuable and uh, more sparse, uh, we're seeing that there's an awful lot of uh, interest in how we can make primary care physicians more productive, hence you see the development of medical homes, but also uh, how we can really help the primary care physicians uh, to really support a lot of these new models that we're talking about, be the ACOs uh, uh, and now the co-ops, uh, as well as some of the insurance exchanges. Uh, one of the things we like to point out to people is that uh, out of all of those applications, there was really uh, only a handful that uh, were really accepted. Uh, now, what, te what that tells me and what CMS uh, is saying, I think, with this type of an approach is they are keeping the bar very high. So there's, it's more than just filling out an application. Uh, a lot of people think, well, we're just uh, doing a grant application or we're going to do a CON or whatever. It really is much more like a business plan, much more like we did in the Medicare Advantage and the old federal qualification days. And they have very specific things that the uh, CMS folks are looking for. Uh, and so those that are contemplating or have made their application, uh, they need to really think a little bit more about uh, if they're going to be a Medicare contractor, what it is that, uh, that Uncle Sam is looking for. Uh, on the other side of this, and I've been quoted a couple times and uh, getting some interviews for it, uh, is there's this private ACO side, uh, at least what they're calling private ACOs. And when I look at the private ACOs, uh, that are treating mostly commercial populations, what they really uh, boil down to is a joint venture between an insurance company uh, and the providers. And most of this is built around a bundled payment arrangement. So uh, as, as would happen in many cases, the insurance company is coming out telling physicians, well, now you're part of our ACO and we're going to be paying you bundled payment. Uh, and there are some advantages for physicians and for the payer, obviously, in doing that. But there's also uh, some very, very detailed joint venture agreements that physicians and hospitals are signing with these insurers and they need to be very careful with, with some of this. Uh, for instance, uh, if the physicians and hospitals hospitals are being asked 
by the, by the insurance company to manage that chronic illness in some way. In other words, they're coming up with some guidelines, but the insurance company is saying, well, you need to manage within this bundled payment. Uh, there is a prerequisite to this course, and it's called Understanding Chronic Illness Management. And many of the physicians and hospitals in their own individual way are doing something along these lines, but haven't collectively coordinated the care. So uh, anybody that's working in the Medicare and Medicaid area, of course, we've had to learn this the hard way. But now, even in the commercial environment, if you're delegating uh, some of the this, as was the case in Florida and uh, California over the past uh, decades. Uh, the physicians and hospitals really need to have that feedback loop in terms of how they're coordinating, what's falling off the chart, what's doing well in the chart, and really how uh, it, probably the newest science that I'm seeing is this whole area of patient engagement, something that is demanded by Medicare and Medicaid in the application, uh, but is also something where people are preparing physicians to see patients even before uh, their particular appointment. A lot of the things that we used to do in the old uh, federally qualified days are now becoming uh, the, the new science, if you will. Um, there's a couple things that are happening then uh, with the insurance companies. I'm going to take it from their side first and say, uh, now if I'm an uh, insurance company and I'm looking at accountable care organizations, uh, that's fine. Uh, and the reason that I'm looking at accountable care organizations for Medicare and for Medicaid may be uh, that my uh, future doesn't look too bright with a lot of things going on with reform. In other words, my Medicare, uh, my medical loss ratio is thinning. Uh, I'm looking at uh, how, how can I survive on managed care premium when the uh, state or federal authorities are even telling me I can't raise my rates over a certain amount. Uh, if the reform goes the way it's proposed, a lot of the underwriting goes out the window. Uh, so what are my choices? My choices, are you there? Okay. Okay, my choices would be to perhaps uh, sell out to a larger insurer or perhaps invest in other businesses. And so people say, well, what other businesses? And when we're talking to the folks on Wall Street, we're saying, well, on the one side of the ledger, if I'm running a health plan, I've got all kinds of administrative expenses that I need to get skinny on. Uh, that would be things like uh, automated billing, uh, compliance, claims performance, uh, anything I can do to cut the staffing ratios and get the machines to do more work, as one person explained it to me. Uh, also, there's some precision that's lacking in many of the organizations that needs to be improved on such things as how do we start measuring physicians and their performance and then can I automate and score some outcomes and tie it to the contract so that there's actually a relationship between the provider's ability to actually create savings and actually getting a score that allows that physician to share in those savings and that that of course is under the Medicare or under the commercial side and if I can get a better return on investment out of my machines then I can grow uh, my enrollment uh, into these other markets like Medicare and Medicaid without a lot of extra uh, staffing so of course that becomes the, the, the big issue and one of the biggest issues in staffing is getting the uh, informaticists and people that can really interpret a lot of this data on the other side of running a health plan business, I have uh, the insurers are working uh, very hard to obviously manage medical expense. Uh, and for years and years, uh, the uh, the sticks and carrots have not worked. Uh, physicians are much smarter than that. Uh, and when we're really at that point where we're uh, trying to encourage more uh, solid relationships with primary care, the sticks and carrots are not going to work. Uh, they've seen all the movies already. So I really need to think more about a shared savings program. Uh, uh, a situation where I could either been quote a two or three year price guarantee for coverage to an employer by knowing that I've got a high performance network that I've contracted with that's really going to follow a lot of the rules. And so uh, the new business here is really joint venturing with networks uh, and maybe even buying primary care practices. And that's where a lot of these groups uh, are very, very uh, excited about the new future saying, well, buying primary care practices, why would I do that? What would be the next uh, situation that would allow me to do that? And uh, that's been done. Uh, actually, a lot of the primary care practices, small groups of physicians, uh, they've been purchased by some of these insurance companies. Uh, even hospitals have been purchased by some of the insurance companies companies in the past. Uh, but the idea here is uh, the investing in individual primary care practices isn't as advantageous for the physicians as being able to invest in a group of small practices. So they 
collectively can actually uh, require a higher price for that collective practice or practice without walls, as I call it, uh, and also can therefore enforce maybe out clauses if one individual physician should want to retire out early or decides the deal is going south, uh, they can go ahead and do that. But what it does for the physician uh, is provide some strength of their asset uh, that they've worked on for years and years. Uh, they drop their administrative overhead usually because the insurance company has some services, uh, some direct billing, uh, claims administration, all of that that uh, the practice by itself would have a hard time affording and probably can negotiate a higher level of reimbursement in addition to that purchase price. So they're making more money and making more money too. So this is, uh, I have a group of 10 that I'm working with in Wisconsin and I have another larger group in Ohio that uh, may be going this direction as well. Uh, people will say, well, how can the insurer do this? Uh, why would the insurer do this? Uh, well, if we look at the next slide, we can talk a little bit about the insurer uh, saying that if I'm getting $750 per member per month uh, for Medicare Advantage and the primary care practice I'm looking at has 50 of those members, then that practice, at least to me, is going to be worth about $450,000. So if I get 10 of those practices, uh, I've got myself a very, very nice chunk of money. So what I can do for those individual physicians, I can offer them each $300,000 for their practice and then offer another $150,000 in incentive payments if the doctor will help the health plan create savings in that amount. So there's some real arbitrage, if you will, in between the value that the insurance company places on the practice and maybe even what the uh, physician's been told the practice is worth in the past, uh, all because these, uh, this entire consolidation of the market and the ability to bring together a lot of these uh, Medicare Advantage as well as the commercial enrollees uh, into uh, a relationship with the insurance company. Uh, now, we're not advocating uh, that an insurance company buy a practice, I perhaps misspoke on that, but rather uh, a MSO that all of the physicians would be investing in uh, that they would own a piece of, and that MSO could be purchased similar to what has happened with Monarch on, on a regular grand scale. Uh, or has happened in other places around Texas, Ohio, and other places where people have said, uh, gee, this is, uh, uh, this is a good opportunity. The insurer owns only 50% of the MSO, so as a physician, I own the other half. But what I do is I get some market share. I get other things that goes with that that I didn't have before. 